Welcome to an incomplete guide to world domination, a podcast by creators for creators, because together we can take over the world. I am your host, Brianna Toiber. I'm Jessica. I'm an illustrator and a co-founder of a creative studio, Lonely Egg Studio, and we're located in the Bay Area. We like working on narrative projects, artistic projects, personal projects. That's a lot of where our work is in. That sounds really cool. So how did you get started doing that or get started in the field in general? Uh, The art field or... Whichever one. We can, we'll get to both eventually, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think creative field, I've always wanted to be in the creative field. I mean, like, that's that stereotypical, you know, when did you start getting into art? And then you're just like, oh, I don't know, whenever I could pick up a pencil. My answer to that is usually yes. <laughs> <laughs> just a broad yes. Yeah, and then wanting to own our own work and create our own work and do the whole entrepreneurial route, that was definitely a a struggle in of itself. <laughs> a lot of figuring out what you what you like and what you don't like and and failure and successes and yeah. <laughs> so are you more on the art side or are you more on the narrative story side or are you one of those people where you do both? bit of both. Yeah, I like creating my own projects. So I'll do the art, the story, the concepting. Um, And then we have projects that we work on for the whole of the studio. And for that one, our main project in the Keeper's Shadow, that one I'm creative director and I kind of have my hands in a little bit of everything. I, I just take on whatever role is needed for the project that we're working on. Yeah, that makes sense. What are some of the things you did and worked on before you started the studio? So before I started the studio, I was working on a whole bunch of indie projects for uh, UC Santa Cruz. A lot of the students at UC Santa Cruz for their senior projects, they have to create these amazing (laughs) game projects and they're always lacking in art. So I did a lot of art for those projects. My partner was also there studying uh, in their game design program. Mm-hmm. So I, I was there and available and needed the experience. So I worked on a bunch of those. And then I went and, well, I started working on a game project that's based on a lot of my material from when I was younger. And then we realized that it might actually be more conducive if we just started our own studio to work on that work. So yeah, that was a lot of my time before starting the studio, was working on other people's projects, private client work, and then working on transferring all of my work into this this game. I'm assuming you went to school for art or something along those lines? Yeah. The art design degree that I got was not at a art-specific school. So I went to Cal Poly, which is a polytechnic school. Mm-hmm. Um, and I studied art there under their studio art program. They also have a really good graphic design program. But when I got placed there, they didn't have enough room in the dormitories for me to stay with the liberal arts students so they put me with the engineering students which was actually great because I found that as much as I love learning from the studio art classes my career path went more along the lines of where the programmers were at (laughs) yeah and also like I I find it's good to like spend time with people and have friends in different disciplines just because you can at the very least learn the language right of what it is that they do and how all of that works if not also like picking up some skills in those areas yep the more varied skills you have i find the more useful you can be in a job and harder it is for them to get rid of you yep that was exactly what i found when i graduated from cal poly is having the best of both worlds it was good to be able to move interchangeably between the two fields Around when did you decide to start your own company? Or, well, I'm, you and... Who My partner, yeah. Uh, Mark. Yeah. I promise I can English. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I just had my first cup of coffee today, so I, I know. <laughs> yeah, so we founded the studio in 2017. And 2017 is when I had a mental break and a mental epiphany. There was stuff going on during those those two years, which made me realize that maybe I really don't want to work for other people. 
at least like on, on the scale of the projects that I wanted to be a part of and create, I had to make a decision of, do I want to focus more of my time owning and creating my own IPs versus working on other people's IPs or giving up my own IPs for somebody else to work on? Yeah. And that came with a lot of like soul searching, asking myself questions. Probably some anxiety. Oh yeah, a lot of self-esteem, anxiety, and things that had to be overcome for that decision to <laughs> to come about. I can imagine because it's it's difficult choosing. Do you want to chase your own dream and run the risk of things not working out the way you want it to, or do you want to go for something that's a little more sure and a little more steady, but it's chasing someone else's dream, right? And that was hard to come to terms with because I think at the time, for a long time, I thought I was going to be like a concept artist or a studio artist, somebody working in a studio. And I always felt that that may have not been the right path for me. And it felt overwhelming to make the switch because I spent, you know, six years thinking that that's what my path was going to be. And then changing all of that diving into a whole new community, culture, way of, you know, methodologies, it was kind of terrifying. <laughs> kind of like jumping into an abyss or something? Kind of. Not really knowing if there's a bottom or another side, right? Yeah, I've I've been there a couple of times. Sometimes you just get into a point where, like, the only way I'm ever going to be happy is if I build something of my own, and it's terrifying. Yeah. But also exciting, in a way. It's exciting. <laughs> we were just talking about how some of our other team members on the game that we're working on, we like had a moment where we just were all talking to one another and realizing how much has happened over just the course of working together and developing something of our own. Like all these opportunities and stuff that have happened in our life that would not have happened if we had not met each other and tried new things. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, what are some of those exciting things that have happened since you started off on this journey? <sighs> I mean, I wish they could be here to describe some of the things that have happened, but things like mental health. We're just, <laughs> we're a group of people all trying to make our own things. And, you know, there's battle with life things that are just going to happen. And it's nice yeah. to have a group of people that we can kind of all commiserate, vent to, be empathetic to each other. Um, it's just nice to have a community at the end of the day where I'm just like, wow, I have a group of people that I really connect with and can talk to. So long-term friendships <laughs> is a big one that came out of all this. Um, Those are always the best, just being able to be at work and be like, you know what? Life isn't great right now. And have people there that care for you, that is huge. Right. Being able to go to events that we would not have gone to, I think, if we hadn't been a part of this project, like the Game Developers Conference and a bunch of like the Indie Game Festival and all that. And having all of our team members, almost all of them getting accepted to work for the Game Developers Conference. We spoke at GDC. We did a whole bunch of like charity streams together. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, it's just all this stuff that if I had gone the route that I had gone before, prior to getting the studio up, I mean, I'd be working full time at a game studio with a contract that was maybe two to four years long. <laughs> Probably a little more than full time, if we're being honest. Right. <laughs> I could probably go into quite the rant about Crunch and all the bad mess. That was that was actually something that the team brought up, too, was when we're working on our own thing and we can be our own bosses, being able to set our own schedules and know that when we tell somebody that we're sick or that we need time off for family or that whatever it is, it's always met with, yes, go do your thing, be well, come back when you're ready and when, you know, you can you can give effort or you're all into it versus like how they're treated at, I mean, we have people on our team who also work other jobs like retail or food. And if they ever try to call off work, you know, it's, it's always the blame game, not really understanding like <laughs> what you need personally. Yeah. I definitely feel that like there are some days where I'm like, I kind of want to call in sick, but I can't it's like, I I'm exhausted, but I can't be that person. I just can't. Yeah. So that's, it's nice to be able to have 
a team or a group of a community that respects your time and you know your commitment and stuff it's yeah nice to be seen as a person <laughs> so great to be seen as a person so what was the reaction of your like friends and family when you started creating and building this company i think friends were I mean there's a different level right because you've got people in your life who are more involved and ones who are more like acquaintances and ones who've just you've lost touch with for you know five plus years so some friends are skeptical because entrepreneurship can be really difficult yeah yeah tumultuous and then you've got other people who are just super happy and they're excited and supportive uh, and you've got the other people who are also supportive, but a lot more dubious. Like they've got questions and they're skeptical about certain things. The the friends that like to quote to you all the different statistics for why this is probably not the best idea. Right. <laughs> and for family, it's always, you know, I, I think it's, they want to be supportive and they try. And that's like the, the best thing that I can ask for is that they just try, even if, you know, it's uh, not particularly helpful. Yeah, I mean, this isn't, you know, their, it, this isn't their passion and it isn't, they don't know all of the things about the particular industry or the news or what what's new and happening. They just know that they care about me. So it, <laughs> it's it's nice that they, you know, that they listen, that they're supportive, that they try to be there. And it's good, you know, that they want to be a part of it. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that's good to hear because I know that sometimes parents don't always agree in different situations or like family members don't always agree and because it's like they mean well, but they don't understand the way you work. Right. They try. They just don't look at the world way the way we do and don't quite get the fact that I don't think I could ever stop creating things. It keeps me sane. Yeah. I'm like, I have to write these stories down. Otherwise, the characters in my head will will not stop screaming at me. <laughs> That's how I feel too. <laughs> Stories that just have to be told, have to be written. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when I have to work on them. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes they're like, they're, they're like screaming like a two-year-old. Other times they're pouting in the corner. Other times you can see them like glowering at you from the shadows and it's kind of unsettling. <laughs> yeah. Art bears the soul, I mean. <laughs> yep. So what are some of the projects that y'all are working on now? The main project that our studio is working on together is the In the Keeper Shadow game. That's a more personal project. That's our, our big flag project. Mm-hmm. And it's a point-and-click adventure game, narrative-focused. It has to do a lot with like parental legacy and all of that in like a fantastical setting. Ooh. The other projects that we're working on, these are projects that we're commissioned to work on or that we just collaborate together on. Uh, We do a bunch of like artworks for other people's covers. Uh, We're making our own side like zine RPG campaign um, that has to do with Eldritch Horrors. Oh, that sounds so fun. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) it's been a lot of fun being able to create, you know, monsters that have this psychological nightmarish element to it that's definitely something i that's my jam um (laughs) so y'all lean more to the towards the narrative sort of feeling like a ttrpg feel than some of the other games right we want it we want it to feel like you're playing through a story or an event yeah we want the players to feel like invested in what's going on I've always said myself, like, I do really enjoy games like that. You don't see them in many places. Well, I know one place I've seen them. One more story games, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with them. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's just also personal preference for some of the people on the team. Like, mm-hmm. we've got, you know, people who really like strategy games, and having a story may or may not really matter. But for a lot of the team... A lot of us are very story heavy. We like feeling like we're playing a role or have a persona or are building some sort of narrative or going in some sort of direction when we have mechanics in a game. Yeah, so you like building something where the player is basically stepping into another character and into another role and they get wrapped up in the story, invested in the story instead of the ones where you get sort of 
wrapped up in all of the mechanics and combat and stuff like that. Right. And I mean, everything has their own kind of purpose. I totally get how games that have that are like more focused on mechanics, it's the players who are building their own experiences, like how they play with other people, the stuff that happens in their game, they're building out their own personal stories. And that's interesting to us too. But I think we like telling stories that are really personal and things that kind of call back to like fairy tales. Oh, yeah. You know, where, you know, you're kind of telling a story from a particular perspective or a culture or, you know, some lesson that you're trying to teach or something you're trying to bring awareness to. Like, we really click with with that kind of motivation. I really like that. Now I'm kind of, I'm just sitting here like, hmm, I wonder if they hire a remote. <laughs> <laughs> just because I, I so very much enjoy that kind of storytelling and I've been curious to poke around in that field myself a bit just because I know there are some tools that I could use and figure out because I've always been about storytelling I've always been about writing I've wanted to be a writer since I was like really little but I guess just growing up I never really considered the fact that it could be possible to do that for a living like in any way shape or form so it's just like oh I'll just do it on the side for fun but right in the past couple of years I've come to realize that I can tell stories for a living and that's what I want to do and part of what I do is I like helping other people tell their stories of how they got to where they are even with all the challenges especially people who are trying to create and build something like you are yeah we're forging our own little uh our own little paths yeah I think a lot of what you're talking about and feeling is something that has definitely it, it doesn't help when we've grown up I think with people around us who tell us that artists and people who are independent like that they must and always struggle yeah starving artist right like having that mindset in your head when you're thinking about doing it is like it's it's almost defeatist <laughs> before even trying. I, I totally get the sentiment of like, can I do this thing, you know, and the struggle and yeah. <laughs> yes. And I, I felt your sort of realization of, hey, you know what? I want to like chase my own dream and help people chase theirs. But I like, I want to go do my own thing. I don't want to do the stuff everyone thinks I should be doing. There was actually a really good article. I can't remember who wrote it. It talks about artists uh, from the past and how they became successful or how they were able to get their work out. And a lot of people were surprised that artists, like, even though they were making their own stuff, they were all part of uh, communities of artists that were helping each other to, like, push out their artwork or tell their stories. Yeah. You know, promoting each other. Like, it was all very community involved. Like, these projects didn't just become famous on their own. Yeah, because we're all in this together, and what helps one person can help everyone. Mm -hmm. We all want the same thing. We all want to have a place where we can create whatever it is that we want to create. Well, within reason, but create whatever it is that we want to create and make a living off of it and make a, the world a better place and sort of give people a glimpse at how things could be and how the world could be because I find like any kind of art whether it's like written or whether it's music or visual art it gives people hope that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and that that light is not act is like for sure not a train yeah because sometimes I'm not sure that the light at the end of my tunnel is not a train. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely like a lot of trial and error. When I started my studio in 2017, I thought that we were going to be purely a game studio and just make this one game. And then we mm -hmm. evolved into a game studio that maybe will work on other games. And now we're kind of like, well, I don't really want to be stuck in doing only games. So now we're a creative studio working on a game and open to other projects. And it sort of became like, somebody asked me a really good question a while back. 
which is like, are you trying to build a game, like a single project, or are you trying to build a studio? Because if you're focusing on a single project, then you're going to put all your cards into that one project. And once the project is done, that's, that's it. it. But for a studio, it's different. They were basically asking, like, are you building connections and a relationship with these people that you're working with? And are they going to work with you in the future? And that really clicked hard with me because a lot of the people we work with, are they're also struggling artists. And the studio, I mean, in particular to one person I'm thinking of, it means a lot to them. Because if the studio evolved to be something where we could find work for each other or work on things together and it benefit everybody who's there. Like right now we're working on a project for somebody else. They commissioned our studio and then I subcontracted out to one of my colleagues. So we found work and we're sharing the 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 work so other people can benefit too. Yeah, so things evolve, things change. I mean, like I never would have expected that our studio would be so open. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel that. Uh, sorry, random yawn. <laughs> <laughs> I had like two cups of coffee today. I should not be this tired. Yeah, I had a cup of coffee and I'm still feeling lit. <laughs> what happens? So what are some of the other creative projects that you think y'all might try in the future? Like what are some other things you think might be fun to create? We would like to be able to create more stories that have to do with personal narratives, personal demons, personal successes told from like people of of the studio. And that could range from a webcomic, a graphic novel, a board game. I mean, honestly, the skills on the team branch so much that we could work on a number of different formats. And I think as long as we're making projects that are human. Yeah, that are telling a very human experience. That's enough for me, I think. And, you know, we've thought about doing other projects, too, that have to do more with, like, charity causes. Mm -hmm. So doing narratives and themes that have to do with, you know, issues going on in the world. We're open to that, too. We've done small charity things and fundraising things just with artwork. But it would be nice to be more involved with, like, a hospital or to maybe create something where what you get from the stuff that you're creating goes to help the thing it's representing right like if they if we did like an informational pamphlet or something for whatever the the cause may be and if somebody buys the pamphlet or buys the the little story and all that money goes towards that that charity like those are things that we like something that's informational something that brings a narrative to the cause and then the cause itself also benefiting <laughs> plus it puts a face to the thing mm. like it gives that issue a story and a human element that people can't help but connect with yeah because it's it's like that phrase says a million is just a number until you've met the one yep yeah i i like that a lot another thing you might want to look into like podcasting and audio dramas because that field is currently exploding all over the place right now, and it can be a lot of fun to play with. Yeah. Something to consider in the future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm down for most projects. Like, my only issue is time. <laughs> oh, I feel that. I'm currently just producing two podcasts weekly on my own. But I'm like, I have all these other things that I want to do because there's so many stories I want to help tell. But I only have so much time and both of these podcasts are making me exactly a dollar a month. <sighs> Wouldn't it be great if we could just create things all the time and not have to worry about money? I know. It's so it's so difficult. The, the forever battle of making something that is for you versus making something that is for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And those days where you're just like driving into work and like do 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 and they're like, oh hey, here's the idea for something. And you're like, dang it, no, I want to work on that because I don't have time to work on that because I'm still working on the other six things I came up with this week. Yeah, that's kind of where we're at right now is taking on all these projects to fund other things and new projects coming at our door and we're just like, no, we got to draw a line. <laughs> like that that moment of if i could help i would but i kind of need to sleep <laughs> at yeah. some point 
that's the nice thing about having a really diverse team though is everybody's also has their own hobbies that they do outside of just creating stuff i love that yeah it's good to be a part of other trades and projects and and stuff that isn't just <laughs> isn't just this too <laughs> It's good to have something you do because you want to do it, not something you do because you're getting paid to do it. So that way you can have something to keep you sane. Right. I stress it. In stress crochet. Nice. <laughs> Very relaxing. And it's also a productive stress habit. Yep. Especially around Christmas time. Ah, yep. Yep. Because <laughs> it's like, why spend a bunch of money on something when I could get like a ball of yarn for like four bucks to make two presents out of it? I've gotten off track. I mean, it's it's kind of not off track. We yeah. talk a lot in the industry about like people who don't have hobbies or all that they talk about is their work. Yeah, yeah those people need ho- hobbies. Or <laughs> therapy. <laughs> therapy is also good. Yeah, being able to step away from work. Yeah, that's been a hard challenge in of itself, being able to step away from the work. Oh, yeah. I feel that. Today is my day off, and I've pretty much been working on stuff since 9. And I'm probably going to be working on stuff most of tonight, just because like, I have all this stuff that I want to work on and stuff that I need to get taken care of, and just, I got a lot to do. <laughs> that reminds me, I need to have got someone else I'm interviewing, and I forgot to give them a link to the discord fixed it sorry i was like if i don't do this now i'm not gonna remember to do it (laughs) i'm the worst about that yeah social media is the last thing on my mind during the day when i'm working on stuff (laughs) yeah i feel that i always forget except i practically live on twitter but that's just because it's a fantastic way to find cool creative people that i want to interview about the cool stuff they create yes also remind me, what are some fun things you do on the side, your fun little side hobbies? Uh, I do a lot of scrapbooking, Ooh. journaling. We have our dog, which is sort of a 24-hour job in a, <laughs> just by herself. Uh, love dogs. Yeah, I plant succulents. I cook a lot. I mean, I try and switch switch between things. And then I do I do game when I can. That's been really hard to do nowadays, though. <laughs> I feel that. I've had to, like, be intentional about it because I'm, like, I usually, like, Sundays are the only days where I'm, like, I like I make myself, like, not work on stuff. Like, I might, I might work on, like, something writing or creative, but I don't work on, like, podcast stuff on Sundays. So I usually either go over to someone's house or have someone come over to my house to just kind of hang out so a couple hours before that happens i'm like i'm going to go and i'm going to play video games because i have some problems i need to shoot my way through or stab my way through depending on the game just because sometimes it's fun to escape into a different world into a different character and just have that little sort of brain break for a while yeah i've also been spending a lot more time trying to develop relationships with you know people around me like it's a big difficulty recently is trying to work within like a normal workday hour, like mm-hmm. working from strictly from mostly nine to five. And after five, that's it. I have to cut it off because my partner also works a full time job. So mm-hmm. if he's working and I work, I mean, he gets, you know, back really late at night. And if I don't cut off my time at five, like we would just never see each other during the week. Yeah. <laughs> That's been really difficult to just like stop working on staring at my screen and working on art. <laughs> I feel that so much. I mean, it's a little weird for me right now because working in retail, I have like my shifts vary a lot. Like I've currently got a lot of opening shifts because one of our usual openers is currently on vacation. But when I have the later shifts, I'm like, what usually ends up happening is if I have a later shift, then I will start working on stuff at nine and not really stop until it's time for me to go to work. But if I have an earlier shift, I've definitely noticed if I open, like if I'm not productive in the mornings, it's really hard for me to be productive later in the day. Right. Which means if I go to work and just kind of wander around the same part of the store without anyone to talk to for at least about two hours, it's going to be hard for me to get anything done that day. Mm. I, I don't kind of get into that groove until it's kind of late at night. Yep, I feel you on that. <laughs> and it's so frustrating. I think the other reason why I 
try to commit to like having set periods of time where I do things is I've noticed that if I work on artwork for a long period of time without doing any other hobbies, without really connecting or going out or seeing other people, you know, basically just like living life, (laughs) my art suffers a lot. Because I think for me, the whole art reflecting life, I, I connect with that a lot. Like my passion for arts and the stories I tell and the very human experiences that I want to be able to show in my work, I can't feel those or get inspired by those things or know about them if I don't also try to live and experience it. So yeah, yeah it's I definitely like need to do it more. One of the things I want to pick up is more volunteering. Oh, so. yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things that I really want to get back into. I used to do like go to soup kitchens and stuff and help out there. But, you know, after I started working on art full time, that stopped a long time ago. And I want to get back into that. I do some volunteering, but it's mostly like I work with kids at church every other weekend. Mm. And that's pretty much it. I work with the elementary kids. So like they're, they're cute kids. And they're mostly well behaved. Some get a little hyper and won't quit playing with the water bottles. But they're good kids. So yeah, it. There's just something about, like, getting out and having that in human interaction, especially if you're just, like, kicking back and hanging out with a friend and, like, even if it's just, like, a super, like, low pressure, why don't you just come over and we can both just kind of sit on my couch and watch a movie or something, just having that human interaction can be huge. All right. And those are things that definitely carry over, like, into my you know, work and storytelling and stuff. I feel like I enjoy capturing those moments because it lets me kind of think about it, meander on it, not to just forget about it. I think it also kind of, it's like the saying of like, you can't pour from an empty cup. Mm -hmm. Your art comes from you. And if you haven't taken that time to like refresh and recharge and like reconnect with people, the people that help you feel a little refreshed and recharged, because I know some people aren't really big on spending a lot of time with a lot of people, but there are some people who help revive you, even if you're more of an introvert. Just right. finding time to spend with those people can help you be in a better place to create things and to give more of yourself. But you've got to take some time for yourself first. Mm-hmm. You can't give what you don't got. <laughs> yep. Combination of all those things. Hobbies, yes. seeing people, getting out, finding things that can separate you from your work a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Taking care of your health. Right. Yeah. And just maybe like allow yourself a day every once in a while where you just don't do anything. Yeah, that's actually a funny thing. One of my friends just started taking Saturdays off completely but having a day from the week that's just she doesn't do anything related to her work and she says it's like one of the best things that's ever happened to her being able to like not worry or and to let go of everything for that day i can't quite do that but i did change my availability so i get saturday nights off so if i if i work saturday it's an opening shift and i can have that afternoon off just so like because closing on Saturdays is a nightmare, like always, especially if there's something going on. But I want to have that time to just chill and enjoy my life and also to spend time with people. Because I play D&D with a couple of different groups of people and there's one where they can only meet on Saturdays. So like I haven't seen them in a while, but since that's changed, I'm going to be able to rejoin. Probably like virtually, but that's also fine but just it gives me a chance to connect with other people Mm -hmm. and step outside of myself and be able to do so in my pajamas (laughs) it's the ultimate goal yeah i'm just like i just wanted to have some i just want to have a job where i can just work from home so i can just wander work in my pajamas or my sweatpants and occasionally like maybe put on a nice shirt if i have if i have a video chat but just Having that freedom. (laughs) That's the, that's, yeah, the struggle. I feel like I ask that every step of the way, regardless (laughs) of where I'm at in a project. (laughs) Just like, where am I going with this again? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wait, where am I going with this again? (laughs) 
Do you have like a favorite annoying question people ask you whenever you tell them what you do for a living? Hmm. Favorite annoying question. Or just like a funny reaction you get. I <laughs> funny reaction. I mean, for artists and stuff, it's always the like, can you draw something for free for my sister or brother or mother who has a birthday coming up? That's asking asking for free like, work. Hello. Right. <laughs> you're funny yeah i think another really common one is the exposure one will you do this thing and i will oh. you know i'll give you exposure <laughs> <laughs> you're funny yeah i i mean those are the most common i think a pretty annoying one is how do you come up with your ideas like how do you come up with things out of thin air that one's really hard to deal with because if I knew where I got it, I would go back for more of them, but it just kind of keeps, they just keep showing up on my doorstep. Right, and and it's like a lot of the stuff that we talked about before, like, you can't have an empty cup and have all these ideas. Like, you've got to have references, you got to have experiences, you know, learning new things. I don't know. It makes it almost sound like creatives and stuff are like another species of the human race that can just like come up with original things out of nothing. <laughs> it's just like not no. no our brains just take little bits of everything mash it together in a ball and then i'm like here the, look what i found i'm like pretty sure that's not the way you found it and i don't know if i want to know where you found that particular idea but thanks <laughs> yep yep so that's that's probably my most like eh, question <laughs> I always like the question, so how do you make money doing that? I'm like, I'm still figuring that part out, but it is possible. Yeah, that's that's a question I wish would kind of die out. <laughs> or just, why don't you get a real job? It's like, this, this, is, is what I do for a living not good enough for you? Right, right. You get that in the creative industry, too, though. There's, there's, uh... Oh, yeah. There's definitely a superior complex just amongst artists, too, where even if you are doing something for a living, it's, you know, they start to question if it's like a, a hobby for you instead of an actual job. Yeah. Yeah, they start comparing who's working harder than the next person. And I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> and just like, mm, you, you, you guys go like beat your chests and figure that out. And I'll be over here doing my stuff. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> People are so weird. And what's something, like a piece of advice or something you wish someone had told you when you were starting out? Or if you could go back and tell yourself? There's, uh, man, the advice part is really hard because honestly, advice is, to me, it's, I say this hypocritically because I'm now giving advice, but, <laughs> but advice to me is super personal. Like advice to somebody is going to be different depending on, you know, your circumstances, the context of your work. And there's just so many factors that matter whether or not advice applies to somebody. I think for me personally, the thing that was the most helpful was having somebody that was there for me. That was more helpful to me than any piece of advice that I got in particular. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I mean, it, I guess my advice would be find something or someone that keeps you grounded and inspired and say yeah because for me like my mentor in high school he introduced me to like all these things about special effects and movies and concept art and all that and he never gave me advice he was just there and talked to me about the work or talked to me about topics that were really interesting you know fantasy the movie making process he never, you know, tried to be some sage person trying to pass off advice. He was always very, I don't know, just kind of like a conduit or a, you know, whatever for what I needed. I wish I had something like that. I've mostly just kind of figured stuff out on my own. But I guess I do have a way of sort of finding my way to a community of other people. So whenever I get hit, get stumped, I can go pester them about my questions and then just kind of keep going. But I can definitely test the fact that having someone that will be there and like help support you and be there for you to lean on is the best feeling in the world. I finally found someone like that and he is he's a big part of like only slightly joke when I say this he, he, of why I'm still sane. 
just because like no matter how stressful uh, my retail job can get or how tired and beat down I start to feel sometimes I know that I can go to him and I'll be there to help prop me up and I have friends, so many friends that I have to go to as well and just having people that support you who are like-minded or at least similar-minded is so huge right because I don't think anyone should have to go through any of this alone even if you aren't going out and doing your own thing you still need some you still need people you can lean on and a support network to keep you going yeah. i mean at least for me personally i don't you know it's different for other people but for me personally it's really difficult to be surrounded with people who either don't really know you very well or don't know you know your struggles that you've gone through in life or know much about your passion or trade and when those are the only people you're surrounded by it can feel like you're on an island all by yourself but just having somebody that's external other than you know you intimately or know you well I don't know that means a lot to me <laughs> it really can it's part of the reason I'm glad I moved to Texas because I grew up in Tennessee and I actually went back there uh last year for Thanksgiving and so, like, I got to see all my cousins who I hadn't seen in years. And then, like, as I was looking around and talking to them about something they're interested in, I'm just saying, like, how am I the old? There's, like, a dozen of us, and I'm the only one who's a nerd. <laughs> how? How did this happen? Life is weird. It is. But honestly, sometimes I, just, I wouldn't have it any other way. Because, like I said, we're all in this together, and we'll get there eventually. Right. Anything else you want to add? Maybe give a shout out to where we can find some of your stuff. Yeah, it's super simple. It's lonelyache.com. And you'll find our projects, our social media. We've got a whole team page that links to all of our team members. So you can follow their work. Yeah, I don't know. Super proud of everybody around us and people on the team. I usually ask if there's any other piece of advice, but I feel like that's ironic considering our previous conversation is of like two seconds ago. <laughs> <laughs> I could foresee the future. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I don't know if I'd want to look into the future. That'd just be weird. Just have me be like really, really paranoid about things. I know. If you could see like two seconds into the future, but you're like, oh, but that third second, it could, it could totally change everything. If only I could see three seconds into the future. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it's just like, uh, okay, so I've, it's always bugged me about prophecies. It's just like when people are told a prophecy and then they go out of their way to avoid the prophecy and by that they cause the prophecy to happen. Like, can't we just have more stories or so here's prophecy? And it's like, you know what? I'm not going to let that weird be out into doing something incredibly stupid. I'm going to find the best possible way that I could take this creepy prophecy and I'm going to try and run that way, because that way might end better. Sorry. <laughs> Weird writer's rant. <laughs> An Incomplete Guide to World Domination is directed and produced by Brianna Toybert as part of Pseudonym Social, a creative podcast network. Music is by Patrick Chester of Chester Studios. You can find more of his work at chesterstudios.net. If you would like to help support our show, you can find us at patreon.com slash pseudonymsocial. You can also leave a review on iTunes to make our show easier to find for those who need it. For more information on the other shows produced by Pseudonym Social, please check out our website at pseudonymsocial.wordpress.com.